Well, good morning. Good morning to you all and good morning to you up in the balcony and to all those who are watching online. Thank you so much for allowing me to come. As Pastor Chris mentioned, my name is Chris, and you can give me whatever title you want if you invite me to come preach, so I love it. Um, so I love preaching. That's one of the things I like to do uh, as I teach at Moody Bible Institute. I teach um, some of the preaching classes there, and so I actually don't get to preach that often, so thank you so much for this opportunity to come here uh, to be with you and to worship with you all today. I want you to imagine with me that a uh, Jewish rabbi, an agnostic, and a pastor walk into a hardware store. Some of you thought I was going to say bar, didn't you? <laughs> this is church. We've got to keep it clean. Okay. No, so a Jewish rabbi, an agnostic, and a pastor walk into a hardware store, and the manager says, uh, hey, you guys look pretty religious. Um, if there is a God, what would be his favorite tool? Hmm. So the Jewish rabbi said, I know. And he immediately goes off down one aisle, comes back, and he comes back with a tape measure. He says, a tape measure? Oh, yeah, God's favorite tool would be a tape measure because he's always measuring us up, whether or not we're doing enough and working enough and all according to what he has written in his law. That's God's favorite tool. <laughs> and the agnostic said, no, that's not God's favorite tool. You know, I don't, I don't know if there is a God or not, but if there was a God, I know what his favorite tool would be. And so he shot down one aisle he came back with a hammer. He said, God's favorite tool would be a hammer. Because what God does is he goes around and he, he just whacks people. He's, a, he's just a God looking for nails. And people are his nails. Boom, boom, boom. He's just whacking them left and right, left and right, causing pain wherever he can. Oh. And the manager then looked at the pastor and says, what about you, pastor? What would you say is God's favorite tool and why? So the pastor thought long and hard about it. He went down one of the aisles and was gone for a while. And finally he came back. He came back with a small screwdriver. And the manager said, screwdriver? Why a screwdriver? The pastor said, yeah, God's favorite tool is a screwdriver. Because a screwdriver's, you use a screwdriver to apply pressure to a screw. And as you apply the pressure, it brings about the screw's intended purpose. God's favorite tool is a screwdriver, and trials are his screwdriver. Because God uses trials in your life and in my life to apply pressure to us, to bring about our intended purpose which is ultimately to glorify him, to glorify God. We're in the middle of a series called Trials and Temptations, Old and New. My colleague last week, Dr. Schmutzer, was here to talk a little bit about Joseph from the Old Testament, some of his temptations, some of his trials from the Old Testament. And I want to talk to you a little bit from the New Testament about trials. Because trials are all around us. It's been said that you are either in a trial, exiting out of a trial, or entering into a trial, you just don't know it yet. And it's true. And that's why I've titled this message, this sermon today, is When Trials Come, Don't Run. When Trials Come, Don't Run. Because, it's a fact, trials will come. They come in your life, they come in my life. Maybe you're in a trial, maybe you're exiting out of a trial, maybe you're entering into a trial, you just don't know it. Or maybe you've had trials in your life, maybe six months ago, maybe six years ago, maybe decades ago. Maybe you've stopped, or maybe you will at least for this morning, and, want, and ask, why did I go through that trial? What was the purpose of that trial? What's the purpose of this trial that I'm in right now? Because when trials come, don't run. 
But, you know, it is our tendency to, to want to run because that's the message that we get from our world, right? Our world says, run. Avoid trials at all costs. You have a difficult conversation that you have to come up with a family member or a colleague, just avoid it. Avoid that conflict altogether. You, uh, our, our society says to, to numb our trials with more work or more debt or more of an addiction. Avoid trials at all costs. That's what our world says. Our flesh, our flesh on the other hand, if we are in a trial, our flesh says, whine through trials. Complain through trials. Oh, I can't believe we have to have another meeting on Zoom. Do I really have to wear a mask when I go into that store? Oh. You know, um, at Moody, I deal uh, with people who have PhDs. Uh, you deal with people who have PhDs, people who have pretty hard days. You know who have the most hard days? At least I think, you know, I think they have the most hard days is kids. I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old. They have mastered the ability to complain and whine. That's my toy. No, it's my toy. He won't leave me alone. She keeps wanting to play with me. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I don't want to go to sleep. I don't want to take a nap. I don't want to get in the car. I don't want to wear any clothes. Ah. They complain through their trials. But you know, we complain through our trials as well. Because our flesh says, whine through trials. You know, some would say that if you're going through a trial... If you're in a trial, that that is evidence that God is against you. Might be evidence that God hates you. Might be evidence that there is no God. That's why you're in a trial. How could a good God allow that to happen? And so we have these three realities that we are either in a trial, out of a trial, or about to enter into a trial. And these three responses of avoid trials, whine through trials, or trials are evidence that God hates us. But God's word says something else about trials. It teaches us something else about trials. Because what God's word teaches us is that trials are not in our lives to torture us. But instead, they're in our lives to teach us. To teach us about ourselves. To teach us about one another. And most importantly, to teach us about God. Yeah, trials are our teacher, not our torture. In fact, if you hear nothing else today, if you fall asleep in a few minutes, at least you know this. Trials are our teacher, not our torture. But you know, we're not the first ones to ever have to face trials. In fact, trials are part of the DNA of the church. You thumb through the pages of Scripture... Uh, godly men in the Old Testament, godly men and women in the Old Testament, and as well as godly men and women in the New Testament, they faced trials left and right. In fact, the early church was flooded with trials. Right after Jesus' re resurrection, Peter, John, and others, they wanted to tell others about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the authorities came to them and said, hey, you can talk about God, but don't mention Jesus. Don't say his name. And when they said, well, hey, choose for yourself who we, what we say, what you do. But we're, we can't stop talking about what we've seen and what we've heard. We've seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they were flogged for it. But they kept telling about it, even in the midst of their trials. You know, one of the biggest trials from the early church came when Stephen, who was a leader in the church in Jerusalem, stood up to the authorities and pointed out to them from Scripture how the Messiah, how Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and that they crucified him. They had him crucified. That the one that the whole Old Testament was pointing to, the ones who say they want to follow the law, weren't listening to the Spirit of God, and they ended up killing Jesus. And the authorities didn't like hearing this from Stephen, so they rushed at him, they grabbed him, they took him outside of the city so it could be legal to stone him to death. And that's what they did. In fact, in the book of Acts, 
when the historian, the doctor Luke, was recording this, he says, on that day, the day that Stephen was stoned, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. In other words, trials broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Can you imagine being the, the pastor of that church? One Sunday, the pews are packed. The next Sunday, you come, and all that's left are an elders, a couple deacons, and a volunteer. Hey, where did everybody go? Well, pastor, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but do you know Stephen? Oh, yes. Yeah, I know Stephen. He knows a lot about the Bible. He keeps me on, his toes, on my toes. Oh, yeah. In fact, he was just at my house last week having a barbecue. Well, pastor, I don't know how to tell you this, but um, he got into it with the authorities. And they grabbed him and they took him outside the city. And they stoned him to death. What? Yeah. And everybody else, well, they heard about that and they thought they would be coming after them too. So, so they fled. They scattered. They went to their in-laws in Judea and Samaria and they had a fear of going out. All that's left is us. You know, in March of last year, churches were packed. Churches, people would come and they would worship one week. And then the very next week, the churches were closed. Nobody came. People had a fear of actually going outside. Not out of fear of persecution from authorities, per se, but fear of catching a disease and so pastors your church other churches had to scramble and how do we minister to people who are scattered and who have a fear of going out and so we pastors use the latest technology available to be able to zoom and live stream our services so that we could comfort the flock who are scattered this pastor in the first century the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, his name was James. And he had to use the latest technology available to comfort his flock who were in the midst of trials. And so he took pen and put it to paper and he wrote them a letter. And he passed that letter around and said, make copies of this letter so that people know what God has to say about them in the midst of their trials. And we actually have a copy of that letter today. In fact, it was just read. James chapter 1. If you haven't already, turn there with me in your Bibles to James chapter 1. Now I'm going to be reading from uh, the New International Version, the NIV version here. But it's great because you have a different translation in front of you. And so you can see the different words so in order to get the overall meaning of what James is trying to say to his flock, to his church who is scared, who are going through trials. James 1.1 1, 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's interesting right there because first we have to ask, well, who is this James character? Okay, he's a pastor of the church, but he's more than just that. Because most scholars believe that James was the brother or really the half-brother of Jesus Christ himself. Which I think that... This person, James, has, or is, you could say, is one of the strongest arguments for Christianity. Because, let me ask you, what would it take for you to believe that your brother is the son of God? I don't know about you, but um, my brother would have to not only predict that he was going to die and rise from the dead, but actually pull it off. Well, James' half-brother, Jesus, did just that. Because James was not a believer in Jesus while Jesus was alive, while he was walking on this earth before the resurrection, before the crucifixion. James was a staunch cynic. And now he's an advocate. In fact, his brother, it went from the title of Brother Jesus to Lord Jesus because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they looked around and they said, James, can you pastor this church here in Jerusalem? And he said, oh, I don't know if I could pastor. I don't know what that means, but I'll help to lead it. 
And so, James writes this letter to his flock. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes uh, scattered or in the dispersion or scattered amongst the nations. And we find that from Acts 8. They were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And he says, greetings. And then in verse 2, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brethren, whenever you face trials, there's that word, of many kinds. Consider it pure joy. Now this pure joy, this endless joy, this is not some just happiness. No, this is a, long, a deep longing emotion that's finally fulfilled because of something that has finally came about. Pastor Chris, are you, you're from New York? Are you a Yankees fan? New, okay, good, okay. You're not a New York Yankees fan. Okay, good. This will make this illustration even better. Okay. Are you a baseball? Do you like a ba- baseball fan? The Mets? Oh, okay. Any Chicago teams here? Not so much. Okay, even better. Okay, even better. Okay, because I'm willing to guess that we have some Cubs and maybe even some White Sox fans in the house today. Okay. Now, if you're a Yankees fan, which Pastor Chris is not, so that's good. Since they seemingly win the World Series, like every other year, whenever they win, the Yankees fans, they, they're happy. I mean, it happens so often, right? But if the Cubs win the World Series, or the Sox win the World Series, or the Mets win the World Series, there is this overwhelming sense of pure joy because it only happens like once a century. James says, that same kind of feeling, that pure joy, is how you should feel when you face trials. Huh? James, why should I feel like that when I face trials? Because trials are our teacher, not our torture. And they're teaching us something. He goes on to say, consider it pure joy, my brethren, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because James knows that we face trials. He knows that his congregation will face trials, more than just the persecution from the church. In fact, even through his letter, he talks about trials of when it comes to work, when it comes to money, when it comes to speech and the words that we use because he knows and you know that you face trials of many kinds it's kind of like how a major league baseball pitcher has many different pitches he can use there's many different trials that God uses some trials are like a fastball you don't even see it coming it kind of puts you back on your heels a little bit You know, COVID-19, that was a fastball trial. No one saw that coming. Put us back on our heels a little bit. Fastball trial. Some of you, you may have been through a trial or maybe you know somebody where your spouse said to you one day, I don't love you anymore. And they left. Or maybe a member of a church. And they said, I can't worship here anymore. I can't be here with you anymore. Or maybe a a niece or a nephew, son or daughter, says, I'm gay. Trials. Fast, didn't see that one coming. Trials of many kinds. Maybe some of our trials are more like curveballs, where you're expecting one thing and then all of a sudden it's something else. Maybe you're renovating your house, renovating a a bathroom or a basement or something like that. And then all of a sudden, oh boy, you didn't know that was behind the wall. You didn't know that was under the floor. You didn't know those prices would go up. It just kind of throws you off, throws you for for a loop. Or uh, maybe maybe it's a job. You thought you would be in uh, working with people all the time, but turns out... Actually, that trial, is you're, you're stuck behind a desk. Maybe it's retirement. You were looking forward to retirement. You couldn't wait for retirement. And then you get into retirement and you realize it's, it's lonely. 
And you, you long for just someone to talk to, someone to be with. Or maybe trials of many kinds is more like a knuckleball. A knuckleball is a slow pitch. It's almost moved by the wind. Some of our trials are like that. They come in slowly and they're, hard, they're confusing. They're hard to figure out. Maybe you've been wanting to share your faith with somebody for years, a coworker, a family member, and you just don't know, don't know how to. Or maybe you have a, an aging parent. And you just don't know how to best care for them. Do we bring them into our house? Do we put them into a home? Are they okay on their own? And, and you, just, it's, you just don't know how to figure it out. Maybe you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter for years. You don't know how to figure it out. Trials come in many shapes and many sizes at many speeds. But remember, trials are our teacher, not our torture. And they're teaching us. But what are they teaching us? Well, James lets us in on that. He says, verse 3, Consider it uh, pure joy, my brother, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops endurance or perseverance, patience. Verse 4, Persever and perseverance or endurance, it must finish, finish its work so that you may be, here it is, mature and complete, not lacking anything, or perfect. This is not perfect, like sinless, but this is more of a, a spiritually mature person. Every semester, when I have students uh, at my classes, what I try to do is to give them the, a big picture of what it means to be a believer in Jesus, what it means to be a follower of him, and what is, what is the main goal, what we're trying to achieve as Christians, what are we trying to be as Christians? What we're trying to become is like Christ, or in other words, what we're trying to do is be, we're trying to become spiritually mature. And I try to tell them that's, that's what you need to be aiming for. That's what your goal needs to be, to become spiritually mature, to be a disciple of him, to be discipled and to disciple others. And you need to be spiritually mature. That's what that means. And that's what James says. He says, trials are our teacher." not our torture, and they're teaching you how to become spiritually mature. You know, I tell my students, it's great that you know the Bible, but Bible knowledge does not equal spiritual maturity. Bible knowledge does not equal spiritual maturity. It's great to know the Bible. In fact, in just a moment, we're going to find out where do we get wisdom from. We get it from the Bible. It's great to know about the Bible. But James will say later on, and just in this chapter, a few verses later, to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, activators of the word, to put what the Bible says into practice. Well, how do we do that? And how do we do that in the midst of trials? Well, James continues on. And he says in verse 5, you need to ask God for wisdom. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Because when you are in the midst of a trial, and you're trying to grow, you're trying to become spiritually mature, and you're asking God, God, why am I in this trial? Or why did I go through that trial 15 years ago? And you come out more spiritually mature, that's called being wise. That's called wisdom. And you know the difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? I mean, knowledge says, it's raining outside. Wisdom says, I need an umbrella. I was not wise today, this morning. But hopefully you can be wise when it comes to the way you look at your trials. Because trials are our teacher, not our torture. They're teaching us how to become spiritually complete, spiritually mature. And in the midst of your trials, perhaps the best thing you can do is just pray and say, Lord, give me the wisdom to know what to do in the midst of this trial. Lord, give me the wisdom to know what to say to that person or not to say to that person, Lord, in the midst of this trial, teach me how to become more like Christ. 
And when you ask, when you do that, when you pray that way, you need to do so, James says, with the belief that God will answer you, that he will give you the path through that. That's what he says in verse 6. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. And so when we ask God for wisdom, ask in a way that, with belief that God will answer, that he will give you the direction and the guidance that he needs, the power of his spirit, when you're in that trial, so you can learn from that trial. I um, lived in the Pacific Northwest for about seven years, and one thing the Pacific Northwesterners stake their lives on is coffee. A home of Starbucks, of course, but also you have all these other just kind of small mom-and-pop coffee shops up everywhere. And uh, I didn't start drinking coffee until I moved out there and had kids. And um, I came to realize, came to learn that there are many different ways to brew coffee. Of course, you have the coffee pot, you know, like you have just the Black & Decker coffee pot or whatever. You have the Keurig, you know, if you just want one pot. But um, what coffee connoisseurs will tell you is that there's there's better methods. There's the pour-over method. But what, what I'm told is the best way to brew a cup of coffee is through the French press. I don't know if you've ever heard of the French press coffee maker. I don't know if you're a coffee connoisseur, so I may be wrong on this, but, but hear me out, okay? So what they say is with the French press is you, you put the uh, coffee grounds in this um, cylinder, and then you put the uh, water in there. You let it steep for a little bit. And then what you take is called a plunger. I know, don't think like bathroom plunger, although it kind of does the same function there a little bit. You take this plunger, and you put it in, and you slowly apply a little bit of pressure to the plunger, and so then that plunger goes down, and it sifts through all the grounds in the water, and so that it separates the uh, beautiful, wonderful coffee from all the the other, the the coffee grounds and the particles. And you just keep applying, you can't push it all down at once. You have to slowly apply apply the pressure. And then every so often, you know, the steam will come out. It'll sift out. Until finally you've brewed the best cup of coffee you've ever had. Trials can be like that. We're in trials. God applies a little bit of pressure. A little bit at a time. But over time, something comes out of that that is beautiful, that is amazing, that is wonderful, helps you to to live, to grow. It's called spiritual maturity. Trials teach us. They teach us how to grow. They teach us how to be like Christ. In the midst of those trials, we ask God for wisdom, how to get through those. Well, then just to finish out our text here, verses 9 through 11, The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. In other words, what James is saying here is that trials come to the down and outers and to the arrogantly rich, They come to us all, but life is short, and life is full of trials. So what he says is that, hey, life is short, learn from those trials. Learn from them. Whatever they may be, however fast they may be coming in, however curvy or they might be, however slow they might be, learn from them. Learn how to be like Christ. This um, summer, actually just a few weeks ago, my family, we were down in Florida. I grew up in Florida, in the panhandle of Florida. I have family down there. My mom lives down there, and she's got a house um, on a bay. 
And she's got a dock that goes out there, and I was sitting on the house, sitting on the, what's that song? Sitting on the dock of the bay. Yeah, that's what we were doing. Um, it was amazing. And uh, our kids would swim in the bay. Now, we have, like I said, we have a five-year-old, and she would love to jump off the dock. She would run down the dock and, whee, you know, just poof, cannonball right into the bay. She loved it. Our two-year-old, he's too young to know what's going on, so he's just kind of wandering around, so we've got to keep an eye on him, make sure he doesn't fall over, you know, fall into the water or anything like that. But our three-year-old, Thomas, we wanted him to, uh, to jump in, to jump off of the dock. I mean, he would swim around, but we wanted to teach him how to jump off of the dock. And, you know, this dock, so just, you know, you have the regular dock, and then you have a little bit of a lower dock to get into the water. And so this lower dock is really only, it's like six inches, maybe a foot, uh, above the water. And so we wanted to teach him how to jump off this lower dock into the water. And so he would... You know, we'd get him all geared up. He'd have his swim shirt on, you know, his swim trunks on. He'd get, you know, he'd still have his, you know, sunscreen on his nose. And then he'd have his puddle jumpers, his little floaties on, and an inflatable ring around his waist. And so he'd stand on the dock, and I'd be in the water, and I'd say, okay, Thomas, you ready? On the count of three, jump, okay? One, two, three. And he'd run out to the edge, and then he'd stop, and he'd come back, and he'd shake his head and say, no. Come on, buddy, you can do it. You see how your sister loves jumping in? You know, she's having so much fun. You can do it. All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. Run out. And he'd shake his head, he didn't know. And then he'd walk down or climb down the ladder and get in. I thought, okay, maybe day two he would do it. So I got him all geared up. No. Day three? No. Day four? No, and it's, you know, our vacation's going to end soon here. Okay, day five. You can do it, Thomas. So I got him all geared up, runs to the end. Do, 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 do. One, two, three. No. So finally, you know, I'm in the water, and I say, Thomas, do you want me to hold your hand? And he looked at me and said, will you? I said, well, yeah, of course. And, you know, I'm already in there. I'm in there. It's pretty easy. I just reach up. And so I grab his hand and say, okay, Thomas, on the count of three, one, two, three. And holding his hand, he jumps into the water. And he loved it. He loved it. He loved splashing around. He loved jumping. He'd get it, climb the ladder and do it again. And he did it again. And he did it again. All because I held his hand and told him he could do it. You know, when we go through trials of many kinds, you need to know that your Heavenly Father is already in the trial. He's already in there with you. And he's extending his hand to you and says, do you want me to hold your hand? I, I know it'll be tough. I know it'll be scary. I know it's not easy. But it's for your good. And I'll hold your hand while you go through your trial. In fact, um, we have to look no further than Jesus Christ. When we think about trials, who Jesus, well, took on the ultimate trial of all eternity for you and for me, as we're going to sing about in just a moment. He was arrested, beaten, flogged, humiliated, and left on a cross to die. Talk about a trial. In fact, just flip over one page of the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured, who persevered, such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart in the midst of our trials. All we have to do is look to him. Look to Christ and our Heavenly Father who's holding our hand in the midst of those trials because trials are our teacher, not our torture. And you know, um, because Jesus made it, you know, he didn't stay on the cross. 
He went to the tomb, but three days later, he rose from the grave. He made it. And because he made it, you can make it. Because he is alive. He is risen. Just as James finally, eventually recognized. That's where he gets his strength. That's where he can write this letter to his congregation who is scattered. Because he knows that his brother, who is now his Lord, is alive. And through the power of the resurrection, through whatever trial you may be facing, you're not facing it alone. Because you have the power of Christ within you. Because trials are our teacher, not our torture. And because of our Savior, he's teaching us how to be more and more like his son, like our, like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah, trials are our teacher, not our torture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I don't know what kind of trials people bring in here today. But I imagine each one of us come in with an imaginary wheelbarrow. And in that wheelbarrow are all of our hurts, our pains, our questions, our concerns, our trials. And Lord, we'll leave there with them as well. But I pray that because of your word, because of the words that James has written to his congregation that has been preserved for us through the centuries that we can learn from our trials and so that ultimately we can glorify you who overcame many trials and through your son Jesus Christ overcame the ultimate trial and rose victoriously for us. It's because of his sacrifice on the cross in his death or in his resurrection over death that we live today. We pray all this in the name of our risen Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us stand together and sing a song of response.